or getting there. There we go, recording. Thank you, Miss Wanstall. <laughs> so uh, the foundation webinars, we're going to go through things at a slightly slower pace. There's going to be a chance for you to ask plenty of questions if you need to. There will be no higher content. So if you need to look at some of that higher content, then it would be an idea to watch Mr. Lamb's webinars separately. And there are less of us in each of these webinars. So we'll be able to answer your questions uh, more specifically. OK, and, and I'm happy to have a hands up situation where you could put your hands up and ask questions if you needed to as well. So let's get started. Year 11. So today we're going to focus on energy and energy is the first topic in P1. And what I would like you to do in the Q&A, and you can answer this anonymously if you would like, I'd like you to think about what words come to your mind when you think of energy. So when you think back to what you've learned about energy, what words just come into your mind straight away? And if you can, what is the unit of energy? What do we measure energy in? So I'm going to give you about a minute or two. I just want you to think. And then if you feel confident too, it would be really good if you did write some of your answers in the Q&A so I can see them. And you can do that anonymously if you would like to. Billy. Yeah, Billy, you're not anonymous, love. So when you do put silly answers in, I can actually see your name. So just starting to think about what you know about energy. Now, if it were me, I'd probably think of, you know, if you have energy, then you can do more things. If, you got, if um, you've got different types of energy that we may have heard of before, I might be thinking of kinetic energy. I might be thinking of light. I might be thinking of heat. And all of those things are absolutely brilliant. Now, we measure energy in joules. OK, and so when you give an answer to a maths question about energy, you want to be writing that J after your number, because that's the measurement of joules. Year 11, if you are making notes right now, please do remember that this will be uploaded to the YouTube later on. Um, and if you aren't making notes, it's absolutely fine. It just might help if you to keep might help you to keep focused if you need to. So what we're going to do now is start to go through some of the content. Now, you have learned this before, but it may have been a really long time ago. So it may not be the things that are at the forefront of your mind, but that's absolutely fine. You've got time still. So when we talk about energy, we talk about energy stores and we talk about energy transfers. And energy stores are the different ways in which energy might be stored. Now, we know that energy is never created or destroyed. OK, there's always energy and the same amount of energy on Earth. And actually, instead of it being created or destroyed, it just gets transferred to a different store. And the stores that you have are, the first one is chemical energy. Now, chemical energy is the store in your food, it's the store in petrol, it's the store of energy in between the bonds of a chemical. So when you are consuming something to give you energy, that's chemical energy. The second one is kinetic energy. Now, kinetic just means movement, okay? So kinetic energy, if there's any movement going on, then that kinetic energy store is there. Gravitational potential energy is the energy store when something is held up high. So if I stand on the top of a hill, I'm gonna have a greater gravitational potential energy than if I was standing sort of at sea level on the beach. And the way you can think about this is if you have something and you drop it from a low height, it will reach a certain speed. But if you drop it from a higher height, it's going to pick up more and more speed. And that's because it had more energy to begin with in its gravitational potential energy store. So the higher up, the more gravitational potential energy something has. Now, elastic energy is simply the energy stored when something is stretched or squashed. OK, so if I pull this hairband, there is elastic energy stored within it. And I know that because if I let it go, it's going to ping all around the room. And I would do that, but I am slightly afraid I'll do something stupid and knock my camera off or, or something like that. Um, but that's the energy stored when something is stretched. That's your elastic energy. Thermal energy, I think you could work out. It's the energy 
with that feeling of being warm. It's, it's your heat energy. Electrostatic energy is a bit more of a tricky one. Now, electrostatic energy is the energy between two opposite charges. So a negative charge and a positive charge. So your nucleus is positive in, a, in an atom and your electrons that go around the outside are negative. And they're held together because of this electrostatic energy store. OK, that's one of the harder ones sort of to get your head around. You've then got nuclear energy, a nuclear energy store, and that's within the nucleus of an atom. And then you've got a magnetic energy store. And that should make sense. When you hold two magnets of opposite poles together, they want to attract. And that's because of that energy store there. So those are the eight energy stores you need to know for your exam. And they may ask you questions where they ask you to tick the energy stores out of a list of different things. They might ask you to talk about how different energy stores are transferred. And we'll look at that in a second. Now, the second column is about how that energy is transferred formed from each, sorry, transferred, I should say, from each of these stores. So, for example, energy can, can be transferred by heating. So when I turn my hob on, my gas hob, I've got chemical energy stored within the gas that's stored um, and that's being piped through to the actual hob. When I ignite that, that turns into th a thermal energy store. It transfers to a en thermal energy store. And that energy will get transferred to my pot, if I'm boiling some pasta or something, by heating. OK, so that's the method of transfer by heating. The second method of transfer is electrical. And that makes sense, doesn't it, guys? We can transfer energy from one place to another through an electrical transfer. We can plug stuff in. And then the third way is radiation. Now, radiation is how energy is transferred through empty space. So it's a bit of a weird one to try and explain. But all you need to know is that light and sound are transferred by radiation. Lastly, mechanical. I can transfer energy from one store to another by literally pushing it. OK, so if I kick a ball, I'm going to have a kinetic energy store in my leg. I'm going to kick the ball and I'm going to transfer that energy by mechanical. And that ball is then going to have some more kinetic energy. OK, so it just passes it along in terms of something actually acting on it. So the first thing you need to really think about is how are you going to memorize these? How are you going to learn these? Now, these are really good examples of things to stick on a flashcard. OK, you could have the eight energy stores on one side and on the back, you could list the eight. You could do a flashcard for each one with a definition and an example. And if you wanted to do the mind map that I will show you in the video, you could literally just list them up the top here and then write down some of your definitions and examples next to it. Now, what I've got on this next slide is an example of how they're transferred. So you've done this in your earlier years in Key Stage 3, but now we need to make sure we fully understand it. So these are two examples of energy transfers in a lamp, OK? So any light bulb lamp, anywhere that you've got given out here, including maybe that one behind me. So let's look at the first one. There is a battery which powers it, and that has a store of chemical energy, OK? Now, that energy is transferred from the battery in the lamp via a wire, a wire. And if it's going via a wire, then it's going to be transferred as an electrical store into the lamp. The lamp then transfers energy to a light energy store via radiation. And that light energy ends up in the surroundings. And that's really useful. That's what you want a lamp to do. But you and I both know that that is not the only thing that happens when you turn on a lamp. Actually, when you turn on a lamp, you have your chemical energy store, which is where you're getting all your power from. And that gets transferred to a light energy store that gets given out to surroundings. But you also end up transferring it to a thermal energy store via heating. And that's because lamps, unfortunately, also kick out heat. Now, no one designs a lamp to give out heat. The useful energy that we want from a lamp is light energy, but we also get some of that useless wasted energy, which is the heat energy. 
And we can work out, we'll do this in a later webinar, but we can work out how efficient a lamp is based on how much useful energy it gives out compared to how much wasted energy. And the better lamps, the better bulbs are gonna be the ones that give us lots of light, but very little heat, okay? Because it's just not energy efficient. This is gonna waste money and waste energy. So these are the typical exam questions. They will say things to you like, a car has a tank of petrol and it starts driving. Describe the energy transfers. Well, in the petrol, there is chemical energy. And that's going to be transferred eventually to a kinetic energy store, isn't it? Because the car wheels are going to move. And you might want to talk about how it gets transferred, but that's your basics. And that's going to get you about two marks. So they're not difficult questions. You just need to be thinking about those eight stores at all times. Now, I'm going to give you a minute to think about these. I'm not going to ask you to write it anywhere. I want to see how many you can remember. This slide is going to stay in the slide, so you can have a go at this at home as well. But just very quickly, how many of these can you remember? I'll give you one minute in your head. What are the eight energy stores? What are the four methods of transfer? Off you go. Thirty seconds more. There'll be a couple that you just can't remember, and that's okay because I'm going to show you them in a second. But really think, this is how you revise best, test yourself. Okay, so I'm going to assume that you got more of the energy stores than you did the transfers. So I'm just going to quickly flick them back on. So energy stores, you've got chemical, kinetic, gravitational potential, elastic, thermal, electrostatic. How many of you forgot electrostatic? nuclear and magnetic. It's unlikely you're gonna get a question to list the eight, but you still need to be aware of the eight. Your heating, your sorry, your energy transfers are heating, electrical, radiation, and mechanical, okay? So try and get those committed to memory as you continue revising year 11, but well done. So the next thing we need to think about is how energy moves in and out of a system. Now a system, is a fancy way of saying things that are connected. So you've got organ systems in your body, the cardiovascular system and your uh, respiratory system. And you've got systems like your computers, they run on a system. But actually, systems are everywhere, okay? My cup of coffee here is a system because it's an object that interacts with another object. There's some coffee in there, okay? But there are different types of systems that you need to know about. Now, these are often one or two mark questions in your exam. They're not overly complicated, but people do forget them. So an open system is, oh, let me go back. An open system is one like my cup of coffee, okay? Energy can transfer in and out of my cup of coffee because it's an open system, there's no lid. And why know that? Because it cools down, unfortunately. By the end of this webinar, stone cold. But my cup of coffee is also an open system because matter can transfer in and out. If it got hot enough, it'd have to be exceptionally hot, some of the water from my coffee could evaporate just straight out. It could also spill because it's open. And so an open system is one where matter and energy can transfer in and out, okay? And matter just means actual particles. A closed system is where matter can't get in and out. So if I put a really solid lid on this, like an airtight lid on this, this would be a closed system because I wouldn't be able to physically get any of the particles that were in here out. But energy could still get in and out, okay? It's still gonna cool down. It probably takes a bit longer, but it's still gonna cool down because the heat thermal energy store is gonna be transferred out to the surroundings. Now, the last type of system is an isolated system. And an isolated system is where no matter, no physical particles can get in and out of the system, the cup, the whatever the thing you're talking about, but also no energy can get in and out. And the nearest thing I can think of, of a good isolated system is kind of like a thermos flask. So you know when you get those sort of um, flasks that they don't cool down, that your coffee, your tea stays hot for a long time. 
Now, they're not a true isolated system because you know that eventually they would cool down. So there is some transfer of energy, but it's about as close as we can get. So open means that energy and matter can get in and out of the system. Closed, no matter can get in and out, but energy can. And isolated, neither. OK, now the way that I think is good to remember this is if you remember that a system is all about energy and matter and whether it can transfer in and out, then I think you'll remember isolated. None of them can. And you'll remember open. Both can. And closed is just about trying to remember that matter can't, but energy can. So it's really that closed one that's more difficult to remember. OK, so that's systems. And that's normally a one or two mark question. OK, not overly complicated. Now, what we're going to go on to now is something a little bit different. We're going to look at some of the types of energy in more detail and we're going to start to talk about formulas. And I know sometimes when I start to talk about formulas, people will instantly switch off and they'll think, "Ugh, maths can't do it. Now, first thing I need to say to you, never, ever get afraid of the maths in science because the maths in science is not hard. You are allowed a calculator, okay? So if you can take that whole aspect of it out, you're fine. The bit that is hard is struggling to remember these formulas and to use them properly. And that's what I'm gonna take you through today. Now, you don't have to do any of these calculations as we go. What I'm gonna do is show you how to attempt them. And then there are some on the slide if you wanted to have a go at later. And in the quiz that you've been set, there are some questions on there that are calculations where you're going to have to use what you've learned. All right. So just leaving that up for a second, that's a task that for your extension, you can go away and do, which is to explain what a system is, what an isolated system is, what a closed system is, what an open system is, and then some examples of each. You're more than welcome to think of something better than my cup of tea, cup of coffee analogy, if you can think of one. So we are going to talk about the types of energy we need to know in more detail. And I apologize, I shouldn't have said types of energy, stores of energy, stores of energy in more detail. And the three that we're going to look at are kinetic energy, which is movement energy, elastic potential energy, which is the energy stored in something that's been stretched, and gravitational potential energy, which is the energy that you gain as you get higher up, okay? So this will be on the slides, so you don't need to make loads of notes now. Um, I would advise coming back, though, to it and having a go at putting some flashcards together for the formulas when you get a chance in the revision stages of your work at home. So the first one we're going to talk about is kinetic energy. And your fancy definition is there on the screen. Kinetic energy is the energy that objects possess due to their motion. Now, remember, motion is just movement. OK, so kinetic energy is your movement energy. And the formula below is the one we need to remember. So kinetic energy, that's KE, and we say KE because scientists, we're lazy, we don't like to write things out long-winded, we prefer a formula nice and succinct. KE equals a half times mass times velocity squared. And we write it as KE equals a half mv squared. A half mv squared. And if you can get that committed to memory in some way, then that's going to help you. Now, the best way, I think, personally, to memorise these formulas is on a poster. Flashcards are really brilliant. They're really good if you keep testing yourself. But if you don't keep testing yourself, they're not that useful. I think the best way, and we've not got long until you're going to have to do some sort of assessment in this, get that formula with the units that the things are measured in on a piece of paper and stick it up somewhere you're going to see it all the time. Then you'll just start to subconsciously learn it. OK, it's a nice, easy way to get you memorising those formulas. You're in year 11. You haven't got to go have it up on your wall for years. So, you know, it's only until the end of the year that you need to have it there. So mass is your M and that's measured in kilograms. Some questions will give you the mass in grams. You need to make sure that you divide that by a thousand to get it into kilograms. Velocity, which means speed, basically, is measured in metres per second. And kinetic energy is measured in joules. Remember, all energy is measured in joules. So first thing I've done is I've gone right. I know in my exam, I might be asked to rearrange this equation. And if you feel confident to rearrange equations on your own, brilliant. I never did when I was your age. I, I mean, 
I did A-level, I did an A-level and a degree in science. I still wasn't totally confident with rearranging it in the exam. I just felt that was too much pressure for me. So I learned how to put it in a triangle. So you draw the triangle, first of all, and then you look at the things that are all multiplied together. And the things that are all multiplied together will all go separately on the bottom of your triangle. So I put my mass at the bottom of my triangle. I put velocity squared on the bottom of my triangle. And here I put 0.5. You could easily write a half if you wanted to. In my mind, when you're putting it into a calculator, it's a little bit easier to write 0.5, okay? And then what have you got left over? You've got your kinetic energy. Now, how do you use a triangle? How do you use an equation triangle? Well, the simple answer is put your finger over the thing you're trying to calculate. So if the question says to you, this car has a kinetic energy of this much and it's traveling at this speed, what is the mass? So stick your finger over mass. And I realize I'm just doing that on my screen, which none of you can see. So I put my cursor over mass. And what am I left with? Kinetic energy over 0.5 and velocity squared. Now, because these two are next to each other, they get multiplied together. So to work out mass, you would do kinetic energy divided by 0.5 times velocity squared, okay? So that's how you use a triangle. Now, more often than not on the foundation paper, they tend to just ask for it as it is, but you may be expected to rearrange the equation as well. So if you can learn how to put things in triangles, that's gonna serve you really, really well. So let's look at an example. And what I've done in this really overly elaborate font is I've written in the way I would um, write it out if I was in an exam. Now, in maths, I know you guys are really good at showing you're working out. You're excellent at it. But in science, for some reason, people forget that that's important too. In science, if you don't get the correct answer, but you give me the correct working out, you could get more than half the marks. Okay, so it's really important you show me what you're doing. So let's talk through this question. So I open up my exam paper. There's a question, probably some sort of diagram, picture of a car or something. That's what they tend to do. And it says, what is the kinetic energy stored in an object with a mass of 50 kilograms moving at 20 meters per second? So it's giving you some numbers and you know it's asking for kinetic energy. So the first thing I do before I even think about what the question is asking me is I'm going to write down the formula. So the formula is kinetic energy equals 0.5 times mass times velocity squared. And that's the formula that I've just got written down here. That's just me going, oh, I know the formula for kinetic energy, but well, let me write it down quickly. So that's the first thing you do. And the second thing you do is you need to think about whether or not you need, need to rearrange it. So what's this question asking me? If it's asking me for kinetic energy, I don't need to rearrange the equation. But if it's asking me for mass or velocity, then I do. Luckily though, for me, it's asking for kinetic energy, so I don't have to rearrange it. The third thing I'm going to do is I'm going to stick my numbers in. So I'm going to write the equation, but instead of writing the M and the V, I'm going to look at the question and I'm going to say, what specifically is the number they want me to use? So I know that mass here is 50 and they've given it to me in kilograms, which is great. I don't have to convert it. And my velocity is 20 and it's V squared. So I stick the squared on there as well. I'm then going to work that out to give me my answer, which is 10,000. Some of you might stop there, but you need to be careful because many questions in science will also give you a mark just for the unit. And the units for that is J. So I will always go through these steps with every question. Now, a little thing to be mindful of. If you put this in your calculator exactly as it is, it should come up with the right answer. But remember that the squared is normally what is done first because of now whether you call it bid mass or bob mass, I'm not sure, but because of the orders that you do things in an equation. So if you were doing this and you're a bit worried about messing it up, do the squared bit first. So you could always write it twice and say, right, 20 squared, do it in my calculator, it's 400, and then I would multiply them all together. That would be foolproof. You wouldn't you know, risk getting it wrong that way. Now, if you do that in a four mark question, you'll get a four out of four. If you've got the answer wrong, you're getting three out of four because you've shown all your working out. You've said to the examiner, I know my equations, I know my units, I know how to do it. I've just perhaps pressed the wrong button on my calculator. And in science, we're not really, we're not trying to assess you on how well you can use a calculator. So you will still get a lot of marks, even if you just get that last little bit wrong. Now, that is something that does come up a lot in exams. And don't be afraid of it. I'm gonna be completely honest with you. I've seen the examiners give you 
the equation, but they don't always. So make sure you've practiced and you know how to use it. And also make sure that you keep an eye on and you keep trying to memorize these formulas as well. So on there, I've got a couple of other examples that as your extension tasks, you could crack on with and submit and see what you've got. Um, it'd be a really good idea to see how you go. But this is only extension work. More importantly, I'd like to do the quiz, etc. So the second equation that we need to learn about, OK, this is gravitational potential energy. And what I've done for you is I've stuck a little definition up the top, which is when an object is moved higher, it gains gravitational potential energy. And it all depends on the mass of an object, how much height it gains and the strength of gravity. Now I've highlighted strength of gravity because I know when I say that people go, what? How am I meant to calculate the strength of gravity? You're not. You're on earth, it's 10 <laughs> and it will be given in the question. I have seen questions where they try and throw you and they say, you know, what would the gain in gravitational potential energy be on this planet? But they'll always give you the gravitational field strength. So you haven't even got to worry about that. The mass and the extra height, that will be given to you in the question and you will have to calculate gravitational potential energy. So here it is as a formula. So gravitational potential energy, I've written it as GPE, but you could also write it as E with the P and that means energy that's potential, is mass times gravitational field strength or gravity if it's easier to remember, times height. And your mass is in kilograms and your height is in meters. Remember, if they're not in those units, you'll have to convert first and that will be one of your marks. You may get a few marks if you forget to convert, but it is important to try and remember. Popping that in a triangle, we have GPE at the top and then we have the mass and the gravity and the height at the bottom because they're all multiplied together. So they go at the bottom of our triangle. So that's there if I need to rearrange it. So let's have a go at example together again. Here I've got a question. It says, calculate gravitational potential energy when your mass is 25, your gravity is 10 and your height is two meters. So the first thing I'm going to do, OK, before anything else is I'm going to write down the equation I know. So I think gravitational potential energy, what is the formula? Well, I know it's given me mass, gravity and height. So I've got to use those three. It's just multiply them all together. So GPE equals mass times gravity times height. Do I need to rearrange? No, because I'm being asked to calculate the GPE and that's the way that I've got my equation written. If it asked me for mass or height or even gravity, un unlikely, but if they did, then I'd have to rearrange it using my triangle. But luckily we don't have to do that for this one. Then I plug in my numbers. So 25 is my mass. It's already in kilograms, so I don't need to uh, convert it between grams and kilograms, etc. 10 is my gravity, mostly always going to be 10, but they normally give it to you in the exam. And my height is two, two meters. Good. I don't have to convert it from centimeters to meters. Excellent. Multiplying those all together, you get 500. And then you put your unit on. So that's it. Formula, do I have to rearrange, plug my numbers in, what's my answer? Units. The hardest bit of this whole process is the formula. And if they give you the formula in the exam, you should fill quids in. That is good because actually that's the hardest bit of all of it. The rest of it is reading the question, is writing some numbers out and using a calculator. And that's it. So there's a couple of other ones there for you to have a go at. Uh, as an extension task. This one down here, the second one, this is your tough one. This is your grade five question. Yeah, this is the question that the very top of that foundation paper because it's asking you to rearrange. So it's asking you for height. Now, remember, I've given you the triangle here and I've told you, you stick your finger over the thing you're trying to calculate and see what you've got left over, okay? So you know how to do it. It would just be a matter of your confidence and don't be afraid to get it wrong. We're revising. You're supposed to get things wrong at this point. The last one I want to show you is elastic energy, but I've popped this right at the top just to make sure that you don't get worried about having to memorize too many complicated formulas. You don't need to memorize this one. This one is given to you in the exam. So if they ask you for it, they're going to give it to you. And like we said, elastic potential energy is the energy stored when something is stretched. OK, now the equation is down below here and it's really similar to the kinetic energy one. It's important to note that your K is the spring constant, E is extension, it's how much it stretches, and then your energy is your elastic potential energy. 
Now, this is really related to a required practical where you looked at the stretch on a spring. I'm going to do a uh, webinar later on just about required practicals because I think they need a good amount of time to go through them, to look at an example, etc. So we will cover that another time, but know that that's when they might come up. And that's it with elastic potential. You may be asked to calculate, but you'll always be given the, the formula and you know the way in which to go about it. You know it goes equation, rearrange, numbers, and then units. So that brings us to the end of the content I want to go through with you. But let's talk about the work you need to do. Now, first of all, I'm dead impressed that you're here. There aren't many of you in this webinar, but there's not supposed to be. That's the idea. We're supposed to be able to work more closely and to get some questions out there if we need to. The next thing you need to do is to complete the quiz on your Google Classroom. Now, the quiz will have some maths questions in there. So make sure you've got a calculator. You can use your phone as a calculator, but just be careful because um, you may need to use like the squared number, et cetera. And that is on a scientific calculator. I think most phones have a, a way of getting the scientific calculator up. So have a go at the quiz on your Google Classroom. That's the first bit of work that you will do. Now, the second thing I want you to do is I want you to go and watch some of this video. Now, I've made one of these for C2. Some of you may have seen it from last um, week. And I basically draw, and I've got one here. I draw a, um, a mind map with you, and I take you through it a bit at a time. And I literally will draw it along as we go. And it, the idea is, is it helps you structure your revision. So there's the pink section up here covers everything we've done in today's webinar. So if you watch the video up until the point that I ask you to pause and to complete the energy section, and then you can do revision resources on a mind map, you can do flashcards, but what would be great is if we could see a picture of it, if we could see what you're doing. And that should go directly to your teacher who can give you direct feedback about the things that you need to do. As an extension, I've already gone through some of the questions on this slide that I'd like you to have a go at. I think lots of you will be absolutely fine with them, but please do try, okay? Now, what I want to do in a second is open us up to questions and, and say that people can go if they want to. Um, this will go on every week. And I know that there are some people in the webinar who you know, will notice that others in our, their classes haven't come to this webinar. Please do, if you found it useful, let them know that this will continue next week. Um, and that it's it's just a different tempo to the one that Mr. Lamb is doing. And it's really specifically working on the skills we need to get our grade fives on that foundation paper. So do we have any questions about what we've gone over? I'm going to stay for as long as it takes to to go through them. If you're happy that you that you've understood it and you feel like you can go off and, and get on with the work, you are more than welcome to leave the webinar now. It is being recorded, thank you, Ms. Wansell, um, and it will be uploaded on to YouTube um, whenever um, Sir gets a chance to do that and it gets downloaded. So if you've got questions, please stay and ask them. If you don't have any questions, please do feel free to leave and crack on with the work that you've got. And thank you for coming. <laughs> Nope. Not many questions, miss. No. <laughs> you can ask them um, anonymously if you have questions, guys. You can pop them in the Q&A. You can put your hand up and you can talk to me. Or not. <laughs> As you read the side. <laughs> I'll talk to you, miss. How are you? I'm fine, miss. How are you? I'm all right. Did, did you get something out of this webinar, at least? Yeah, I did. Yeah. I tried. Okay. <laughs> Good. Excellent. That's what that's what we like to hear. So, guys, the last two who are in, do you have any questions? Is that why you're still here? Something that you want to ask? Because if not, please do feel free to leave and go and get on with some of that work. Nope. <laughs> Taking my advice. And last but certainly not least, Tilly, do you have any questions, lovely? If not. You can go and crack on. And it's just you, Tilly, so there's no judgment now. No, exactly. <laughs> you get two on one tutorial. It's true. It's true. Very few get that.
Well, I'm not sure if Tilly's there or maybe Tilly's not able to leave the webinar because she's not asking any questions. Um, I think what I might do is leave it there then. Tilly, if you are there and you can hear us, please feel free to uh, pop an email to one of us if you want your question answered, but you just didn't want to do it in this format. Okay. Uh, Miss Wonsall, thank you for all your help. No and I'll see you next week. Yeah, see you next week, Miss. Bye. Bye. Bye.